Part 11, call to faith. Lord promises to bless Jerusalem. I'm going to go through the text today. Uh, this is, we're looking at Zechariah 8 uh, of our text. Um, this, is, this is a kind of continuation, obviously, from 7. We do speak a tiny bit about fasting, uh, but we don't really go into that apart from to say that fasting has changed uh, as we look at Zechariah 8. Uh, and God uh, invokes and changes the fastings, as they were, the, the feasting, to a one of joy and celebration. And so uh, I hope uh, we can help we sort of close that thing around feasting and learn actually when it's appropriate to fast and when it's appropriate to feast. And I hope this will close that off. But mostly today I'll be getting on to what we're going to talk about after we get through our verses. So this is Zechariah 8, 1 to 5. Uh, it says, The word of the Lord Almighty came to me. This is what the Lord Almighty says. I'm very jealous for Zion. I'm burning with jealousy for her. This is what the Lord says. I'll return to Zion and dwell in Jerusalem. And Jerusalem will be called the faithful city. And the mountain of the Lord Almighty will be called the holy mountain. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Once again, men and women of ripe old age will sit in the streets of Jerusalem. Each of them with cane in hand because of their age. The city streets will be filled with boys and girls playing there. So what is he looking at here? What's he saying? Um, God, as he starts to speak to Zechariah, he introduces himself with this title, declaring his power and majesty. And he says, this is what the Lord Almighty says. He says he's the Lord of hosts, the armies of heaven. And it's meant to give this picture that now uh, of almost authority, this sense of what God is about to say through Zechariah is to give him this, uh, give the people this kind of stamp of authority and say he's, he's promising them something that will come and you need to believe in the promise because here is the Lord of hosts, the Lord of armies, the Lord Almighty himself. And in his power and majesty, comes an intense jealousy as we read for what is God's own. And so God treats us more than just his creation, uh, more than just things that he's created. He loves and he wants to save us as human beings. And then he puts human beings in charge. We find in Genesis, there's a plan coming together from our point of view. So God has said, you are mine. You are are mine and with that comes exclusive ownership it's not shared it's not just a title it's exclusive ownership which means that when God says he's jealous we should be very alert to those words when God says he is jealous for what we're doing for rejecting him there's not just a human jealousy that we might know about that we might feel this is a you are mine, no one else, absolutely no one else will get you, will have you. And so when we understand that, you start to understand the sense of grace that's going on. In our disobedience, God quite rightly can say, you are disobedient, you're no longer mine. You're even mine or you're not. And yet, within what we read in Zechariah, God is gracious. God is still jealous for when we don't obey him but he's gracious also. I should put this down. John 10, 27, 30, just to give you that idea. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my father's hand. I and the father are one. Because of this ownership, God tells his people that God's people and the city will be transformed by the presence of the Lord. It will be transformed into a place of truth and holiness. So too the will, uh, will the people of God be transformed. And so he started to draw this picture. Understand that what I'm doing will not just change the city, but in order for the city to be of any worth whatsoever, you must change also. We talk about church and we say the building, church is not the building, it is the people that worship the Lord that's in it. 
This church is pointless and has no direction if what we do is we, we elevate the church building to a level that is uh, almost that's, that's what church is. Here, just as that is the same example here, is not the building, it's not even the temple, it is God's people ultimately uh, that will need to see that God is doing a great work. And we see in Zechariah 4 to 5, uh, once again, men and women of ripe old age will sit in the streets of Jerusalem, each of them with cane in hand because of their age. The Lord promised that all would change one day. This day would come and young and old together would enjoy the city in safety. And this was quite significant in this time uh, because in Zechariah's time, Jerusalem's walls were ruined and the city wasn't safe and it wasn't secure. And so God says, as they look out amongst this city, they see the walls half ruined and things just there's no safety and security whatsoever god says it isn't about that that will be fixed but it you will only find security in me in what i do and what god does the only security ultimately he's trying to get them to see is in him and then he goes on um zechariah 6 to 11 this is what the lord almighty says it may seem marvelous to the remnant of this people at that time but will it seem marvelous to me declares that that declares the Lord Almighty. This is what the Lord Almighty says. I will save my people from the countries of the east and the west. I'll bring them back to live in Jerusalem. They will be my people and I will be faithful and righteous to them as their God. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Now hear these words. Let your hands be strong so that the temple may be built. This is also what the prophets said who are present when the foundation was laid for the house of the Lord Almighty. Before that time, there were no wages for people or hire for animals. No one can go about their business safely because of their enemies, since I turned everyone against their neighbour. But now I will not deal with the remnant of this people as I did in the past, declares the Lord. A change <clears throat> in what the Lord is going to do. The promise of a transformed, prosperous, a safe Jerusalem, uh, Jerusalem seemed probably quite fantastic to these people a big promise considering what they can see with their eyes hard to believe when a city was half built even more so considering that walls wouldn't even be built for another 60 years but what god is trying to do is trying to tell them is saying just because it seems too big for you it's not too big for me Nothing is beyond rescue. Nothing is beyond my power. Spurgeon says, often <clears throat> times when you see what the Lord has done, you are ready to cry out, how can all this be? His goodness, his mercy is, it, is as great as this. Is it as great as this? Rest assured that you have only seen a little of his goodness, as it were the kitchen of his great house. You've not seen the palace of the Most High. Where, where he reveals his full power and splendor. It's a great quote. Understanding that even in this moment, uh, to kind of step back and go, oh, 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 from our point of view, this seems quite big. From God's point of view, he's really just doing a tiny city. I mean, I don't know how it looks to God, but this is minuscule in terms of the practical uh, appearance but actually, this is, this is doing something bigger. This is building for Jesus. This is getting ready for when he returns. And so they're only seeing one small part. And yet even that part is, is kind of hard to understand and to acknowledge and calculate. How, how is God going to work in this? How is God going to build all this wreck, these ruins? So God then promised a gathering from exile to come that would far surpass the present gathering. He says they'll come from east and west. It would not just be this geographical gathering anymore. We switch from a sense of uh, the Old Testament because we're kind of now in old and new in a weird way. Zechariah's talking about the future as well as the present. Now we're talking about a spiritual gathering. It won't be just that their address changes, their location, but now their hearts have to change with it. And even though they face this kind of lack of resources, this lack of uh, building materials and all sorts of, of things they need, they face opposition. 
God still wants them to find strength for the work. He says, let your hands be strong. And he promises that if you do, this city will be more than your effort, more than what you're put in physically, more will come than that. And so God allows this period of difficulty, but would not allow it to last forever. He would bring prosperity and blessing to this once afflicted nation. He goes on, 12 to 17, the sea will grow well, the vine will yield its fruit, the ground will produce its crops, and the heavens will drop their dew. I will give all these things as an inheritance to the remnant of this people. Just as you, Judah and Israel, have been a curse among the nations, so I will save you, and you will be a blessing. Do not be afraid, but let your hands be strong. This is what the Lord Almighty says, just as I had determined to bring disaster on you and show no pity when your ancestors angered me, says the Lord. So now I have determined to do good again to Jerusalem and Judah. Do not be afraid. These are the things you are to do. Speak the truth to each other and render truth and sound judgment in your courts. Do not plot evil against each other and do not love to swear falsely. I hate all this, declares the Lord. <clears throat> Excuse me. When I find that God uses the word hate, it is so much more than the hate that when we use that word it's so much more it means a lot more to for god to use the word hate again it needs to make us stand up and think well okay for him to hate something takes a lot for him to hate those things that we do it must mean it's pretty bad anything that we can hate is is nothing in comparison to the hate that god has towards people who do not honor and obey, obey him who purposefully go against him he hates all this he says but god wants israel to trust in his promise of blessing let the promise encourage them in strong service god promised blessing to israel instead of a curse he says i used to do that i did that because you deserved it but your ancestors they disobeyed me they kept walking away from me but if you if you come back to me i will once again answer your prayers i will bless you and the city i will grow this place it will be a place where everyone will come to god promised blessing to an obedient israel and cursing to a disobedient israel so they must be obedient if they were to see god's blessing on them so god tells them due to this glorious future that's about to take place it is not a time to fast but to feast fasted to mourn now you feast to glorify the god who rescues you from your mourning and brokenness he says they should be times of joy and gladness and for that reason god tells them love truth and peace the word of the lord almighty came to me zechariah 8 18 to 23 this is what the lord almighty says the fast of the fourth fifth seventh and tenth months will become joyful and glad occasions and happy festivals for judah Therefore, love, truth, and peace. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Many peoples and the inhabitants of many cities will yet come. And the inhabitants of one city will go to another and say, let us go at once to entreat the Lord and seek the Lord Almighty. I myself am going. And many peoples and powerful nations will come to Jerusalem to seek the Lord Almighty and to entreat him. This is what the Lord Almighty says. In those days, 10 people from all languages, nations, will take firm hold of one Jew by the hem of his robe and say, let us go with you because we've heard that God is with you. It's amazing, isn't it? It's amazing blessing that's to come. And people will understand the true God and go, I want what you've got. I understand this real God, this true God is with you. And so God promises a redemption so great that one day the people shall come to the glorified city. And he tells them, those people, he says, those people will come, they'll grasp it and they'll never let go. They'll never want to let go. Once people realize that God is with those who are his people, they will too want to come to God also. And so what shall we talk about today to help us understand uh, our context in this, uh, knowing uh, the context of the verses? We read in Zechariah that in God's grace, He'll bring them out of mourning. 
but show, uh, but show that he's been there in their suffering and in their celebration. He's been there all the time. And so our application is understanding and knowing that God is present in all states we find ourselves. And what is key that Christians, for Christians is that we don't live for the sole purpose of making our lives in this place better. It's not to improve our current state in the sense of our physical, even our financial or whatever being that relates to our place in this current world. Instead, now Christ lives through those that believe. We live for the sake of Christ. And so whatever state we are in, all things work for Christ. And therefore, for others' good. So when we look at this city, we look at the promise of the city that is to come, it's not only for God's people in that immediate moment, what's going to come is other people are going to come. But as they are obedient to God, their obedience, even in their suffering, even in their good times and bad times, will be an example of Christ to those that will come and see. And so I wanted to talk about this. Uh, I found this, um, <clears throat> this verse, kind of, uh, it came to me in terms of, I think what's quite relevant, Colossians 1, 24 to 27. Um, and, and just even the first verse, which I'll go into, is just learning about what Paul's actually saying, I think helps us to understand why suffering happens and why it's important not to say, I just suffer for a time because I'm a Christian. It, it's more than that. It's so much more than just saying, I suffer because I'm a Christian. He says, now I rejoice in what I'm suffering for you and I fill up in my flesh what is still lacking in regards to Christ's afflictions for the sake of this of his body, which is the church. I've become its servant by the commission God gave me to present to you the word of God in its fullness, the mystery that has been kept hidden for ages and generations, but is now disclosed to the Lord's people. To them, God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this, this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. And so... I wanted to talk about this today because this is what he's doing in Zechariah. He's instilling this, this promise, this hope of what's to come. And so we also stand on this promise of what's to come when Jesus returns. And so we're also told to do the same. This, there's, a, there's a principle here, regardless of whether you've got Zechariah or Colossians, the same principle is being applied here. Can you hope for the glory or are, you just so, are we so concerned and wrapped up in the now that we only want to be soothed for the now. Where's my confidence? Is it in the things that I see that are not, that kind of get fixed and I feel a bit better today? Or is it that I'm actually trusting in God in the future and saying, he promised that Jesus will return and he'll fix everything, regardless of what we see around us. And so I thought, looking at these verses, I think this would be taken as an outcome of what we read in the, sort of last verses of Zechariah 8, specifically that God's people are called to be a blessing. Love, truth, and peace, a reflection to others that God is with us so that they may also come to a knowledge of the one true God. As Paul wrote here in, in Colossians to the Colossians, one of the things that is clear about Paul is that he was able to see that his suffering was working good for others. It was doing something to them. And so Paul follows in the footsteps of Jesus. And there's this term that, you, that people use. It's not used very often, but other-centered. Paul was others-centered. As in, he, he lived for Christ, but he wanted to show others in order that they may come and also believe in him. He is, as far as he is concerned, saved. His life is with Jesus. He says that so many times in so many parts of the Bible, in each, in so many books, that he is, I'm, I'm pretty much there already. The only reason why I'm not actually there right now is because my body's still alive. But everything about my spirit, I'm, I'm there with Jesus. I'm, I'm there with him all the time. And if it, was, if it was to go with him, here we go with him. But if Jesus says not yet, and he says, then I will stay. Then I will continue. And so he follows in the footsteps of Jesus. Paul found holiness, spiritual growth, and maturity 
when he pursued these things for others, when he knew that what he was, when he was serving Jesus, what that was doing was showing others how Jesus suffered. It's very careful how you can exp- need to explain the suffering of Paul and the suffering of Jesus, and I'll explain that. It's an important aspect of being Christ-like in the life of a Christian. How do you be Christ-like? We say this all the time. How do you do that? How do you be Christ-like? One of those things is to suffer. One of those things is to suffer like Jesus suffered. I'm not saying go and look for suffering. I'm saying that when it does happen, it will happen. But how do we react to it? How do we react to suffering in our own lives? Do we try and shake it off? Or are we misunderstanding the purpose of suffering in our lives? Jesus told Ananias that he would show Paul how much he must suffer for Jesus' name. Acts 9, 15, 16 said, But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Jesus knows Paul. He knows every single person who has lived, is living, and will ever live. But Jesus knows Paul absolutely to a T. Jesus knew how Paul would be most effective in sharing the gospel. He says this himself, 2 Corinthians 12, 7 to 10. Therefore, in order to keep you from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan, to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said, he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults and hardships, persecutions, difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Paul's purpose in sharing the gospel was not only in sharing the gospel, <laughs> It wasn't simply going out and speaking about Jesus. Now, some can do that, and we all struggle from time to time. How do we share Jesus with people? But Paul is kind of almost, his life and the way he lived was not just speaking about Jesus. The way he suffered was meant to reflect to those he spoke to as an example of what Jesus went through. And again, we'd be really careful here not to, match Paul and Jesus on the same level in terms of suffering. But it is what he was meant to do. So it doesn't mean that Paul thought his suffering was anything like Jesus's or in comparison to him. But because he suffered for the gospel, his suffering would in effect be a Christ-like suffering in that in his time. So Jesus is now ascended, Jesus is with the Father. But now he there's a sense that actually Jesus knows People need to not only hear the gospel, they, they do need to feel it. They need to know what Jesus went through in order that we may live. So just as Jesus suffered and died on the cross, even then on the cross, reaching out with grace and love to the very end before he gave up his human life and paid for sin in a smaller, but just as in more, just as a powerful way, Paul's suffering would speak to those he reached out to. It wasn't just that Paul suffered because he was a Christian. His suffering was doing something to others. His his suffering, as honest he was about it, was actually helping people to understand what it meant to follow Jesus, what the cost was to follow Jesus. When they saw Paul, there was a small part of understanding of Jesus' own suffering. And so why is that important for us? Because I want us to understand something about suffering. I worry that we take suffering and we, we try and put it aside. We try and say, no, that, that we just ignore that. We just put it aside. We wait for it to go. In fact, the suffering is an example of how will you react in the presence of others when you're suffering? Because when I'm not suffering, when I'm not stuck in a, a real horrible place in my life, I can, I can talk about the gospel. But can I talk about the gospel? Can I have the same level of intensity when my life is a mess? 
when I'm suffering? Can I speak to the same people when my life is a wreck? And have the same determination, I still love Jesus, no matter if I was suffering or in riches. Here is the purpose of Paul, and so the purpose for us. It's so that we can understand why God allows it to happen, or certainly in the case of Zechariah, decides it should happen for a good reason. In Zechariah 8, God refers to no longer treating his people as he treated the remnant, because now through what was to come in Jesus, that disobedience, that rejection of God would be paid for by Jesus' suffering and death on the cross. And yet, here's the strange thing about being a Christian and recognizing the cross. It is of celebration on the other side of the cross that Jesus died. We celebrate because he gave us life, because when he died, sin was paid for. We're sad because in the moment it happens and we, we, we call sin to come into the world. It was us. It was our fault. And yet there's this other side, just as he talked about in the feast, they will turn into joy, turn into celebration. From death, he's bringing them into life. I will no longer treat you like your ancestors, he says. I will now treat you well, bless you, as you do not deserve, but will still give you anyway. purpose of suffering is not just for the sake of being a Christian. The suffering of, a, of the Christian is used by God to show others that as Christians, we respond differently to it. The suffering is used as a small token in comparison to Jesus' suffering. To take the sufferings of Christ to others. How that is done is how we react to it, knowing that others know we are Christian. 2 Corinthians 6 verse 10, sorrowful yet always rejoicing, poor yet making many rich, having nothing yet possessing everything. Here is the contradictory life, certainly in terms of the world, that we are called to live. Having the same view of and level of hope in our suffering as Christians is absolutely bonkers to this world. They do not understand. When you accept Christ and you go through a time of suffering, when, when, when everything is just almost at a loss, and yet the one thing that's keeping you going is you know you've read the word of God and you've trusted what he said about Jesus Christ. Even as hard as that may be, the one thing we hold on to is Jesus. The world says, that's insane. Either the world says, give up, you're a lost cause, or just ignore it and it will go away. The world think certainly that we are bonkers. It is two things, times are bad, I have hope in Jesus. Times are good. I have hope in Jesus. Your emotional reaction may change. Your, your cry may change, good or bad, in terms of the times that you're having. But I trust in the promise that was made. We trust in what God says in his word, that no matter what happens here, he says, the plan is coming together. You cannot see it and you may not be here to see it. But God's saying, I'm telling you, I did it once and I'm going to do it again. Jesus is coming back. We are called as Christians to have our eyes set on the prize at the end of this race. And that prize is, of course, being with Jesus. And so I want to encourage us today from away from a topsy-turvy relationship with Jesus. I want us to understand that a faith driven by emotion of a present state on any given day is not a way to have a healthy relationship with God. Let me put it this way. 
It's really key if you remember how you came to Jesus, how you probably we come to Jesus every day, no doubt, not even just the first time. But do I come to Jesus? Have I believed in him because of an emotional state I was in at the time? Or, and this is okay, do I react emotionally to what is true that's written in the word? Perfectly acceptable to emotionally react to the salvation of Jesus Christ. It is unhealthy to come to Jesus depending on your emotion. Do you see what I mean? The difference here is how you're driven. Are you driven by emotion to Jesus or are you driven by truth? I will guarantee you that our emotions are true 5% of the time, roughly. And I just pluck that out of the air because I think emotions are so wavering, they just go from side to side, from place to place. And here's where churches, as leaders, as preachers, need to be really careful. What we're not doing is selling a soothing emotion to people. Because guess what? Tomorrow, something terrible will happen, and you'll go, well, this can't be God, can it? Because I'm not on a high anymore. I feel rubbish today. We need to be careful that what we're not peddling is emotional faith. What comes first is faith, truth in the word, and I react emotionally to that. How can you not? In varying degrees, by the way, there's no specific way you need to react, but something in some way, big or small, when you read the gospel, when it finally breaks through, something will disturb your emotion about it. But I won't come to Jesus because of it, not because of my emotion. For the people in Zechariah's time, God promised them that a future hope is not some far away dream. He's not trying to give them a nice thing to just think about for now. Instead, he draws this picture and principle that if we're obedient and trust in all the states that we're in and the times we find ourselves in, we will be part of this future. What God calls on his people to do is not trust in the temporary things they see now that leads to highs and lows, ups and downs, but calls on them to trust in what he has said. Trust in hope. The building of the temple would be the greatest test of their faith. Would they be willing to put all that work in, all that effort in to glorify God, to serve him, and yet not fully see the purpose of why they're building it? Will they be willing to do that? That's what we do today when we trust in Jesus, because not because of now, but because we know he said, I am promise you I'm coming back. So even if we don't see it here, we will still see it. When we join him in the heavens, we're going to see all of this stuff happen. But we are so focused on our physical and our flesh, it's very difficult to, 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 to kind of almost disregard it and say, Lord, I'm not going to let my flesh drive me. I'm not going to let my, my, my up and down emotions drive me in my relationship with you. So this temple will be the greatest test of their faith. They were building this temple for a time when Jesus would come and tear up the tables of the money changers. They're never going to be there for that. He says, trust is going to happen. Jesus is coming. So here's what I want us to take away as a finish here today. It says to Colossians 1, the last verse of our reading in Colossians, to them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of his mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. There is a change that takes place in the person when we accept Jesus Christ as our saviour. The viewpoint of how we live our lives changes, and it should it goes from one about how I serve my needs to one that looks to serve the needs of others in sharing the very real and painful truth 
of the gospel with them. Do we believe in Jesus because he soothes our various emotional states? Or because despite the ups and downs of how we feel, we believe in the gospel that presents a hope you can't sum up in an emotion. The emotional reaction to the gospel is fleeting, is momentary. But what matters is, do you trust in what's said, regardless of how you react to it? Do you trust in the Bible? Do you trust that everything written in it is true? Are we allowing God to build us as a temple, as he calls us, for the future hope that is not seen, for our good and for others around us? And so ultimately glory to God is given. This is the Christian's hope of glory. This is what it is about. And this has been a struggle to understand where emotions fit in as a Christian. Where do emotions, where are they useful and where are they dangerous? And I've looked at this time and time again. There is the extreme that we find where it's, it, it's just incredibly emotionally driven. I have no doubt, and let me be clear, I have no doubt that people are worshipping God. But God doesn't change his mind or do something different because you're more emotional to him or because we might throw ourselves around the room. Do you understand what I mean? Because we might shout at him even more. We might, our prayers might be louder than yesterday. God doesn't change because of how our volume changes or how our reactions are. Because what does the Bible say? He sees the heart. And so all of this flaying around means nothing if none of this has changed. If none of this has changed or changing, it means nothing. That is the Christian's hope of glory. And here is the contradiction that the world will struggle with. Here is the contradiction that non-believers will struggle with. It is true that God calls us to respond to his grace and love and salvation. It is absolutely true that we then seek to be more patient, that we then seek to be more loving towards one another and to others, that we serve him, that we change our heart, continue to let him to change our heart. But the bottom line here is this. It isn't our own hard work or even our level of devotion to God. Remember, faith as small as a mustard seed. It isn't our own hard work, it isn't a level of devotion, or the power of our own spirituality. Instead, it is the abiding presence of Jesus. It is only possible because of Jesus. People can do whatever they like in terms of worshipping him and they can do to the most extreme. Maybe, what, what, I'll take David, okay? There's a most extreme. It has context, by the way. Dancing in his underpants, it has context. But I'll take that because David is worshipping God, he's glorifying him and he just loves God. But let me say this. None of all that stuff actually matters unless my heart, body, mind, soul, everything is changing for him. Our emotional states and the way we re react to God will not change a iota in here. Not one. If I'm outwardly showing my God, that's fine. If, you, if you're one of those people that stand in your arms, worship the Lord, do it. If your heart is because you love Jesus and that's you just can't help but reacting, reacting to Jesus is absolutely fine. It's great. But here's where I'm worried. Reacting to Jesus because others are watching, be careful. Be very careful. 
it is not a healthy way to worship God or have a relationship with him. So if you stand when you worship and or you sit when you worship or you fold your arms when you worship, it doesn't matter. If you pray long prayers, if you pray short prayers, it doesn't matter. Because what God knows is where that's coming from. And I warn us as this church and any other person that's listening, be careful what you're saying to God in the things that you do. Be careful that they're actually true. God is jealous. God hates disobedience. And here it is simply, come to Jesus, accept that he's your Lord and Savior, and the work is done. Isn't that amazing? And yet we find ways to make it hard. No need to. Jesus done it, by the way, in case you didn't know. He came, fulfilled the law. No need for anyone else to try and make it perfect. Jesus has done it all. And so now we have come into his presence and say, Lord, thank you. Let's pray and then we'll worship.